Boeing's used to getting its way with the Patsy FAA. And this time, however, it's in really hot water. If it continues to dig its heels in, uh, it's going to uh, expose itself and its executives to potential criminal prosecution. Cause Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. Later in the program, we'll show part of the demonstration in New York City against fascism and racism. It had been in the works for several months, taking greater urgency, of course, after the massacre of 50 Muslims in New Zealand. There are a number of vigils of sympathy for the Muslims of New Zealand in the United States in subsequent days, and that's all well and good. But why isn't the U.S. government taking steps to prevent another massacre? After 9-11, Muslims were put under the spotlight in this country purely because of their religion. Why aren't the feds looking at the haters who openly spread racism and incitement to violence? Why aren't they calling some of them downtown to have some discussions? Why aren't they going to some of their homes to inspect, to see if they're gathering together actual arsenals? Kudos to the Prime Minister of New Zealand for the actions she's taken, for the sentiments she's given. But when she was called by President Trump and asked if there was anything he could do, I wish she had told him, end the Muslim ban. More about fascism later in the program. First, Boeing. You know, of course, about the terrible disaster in Ethiopia. You may not know that Ralph Nader's grandniece was killed aboard that jet. Well, for more, we're joined on the phone by Ralph Nader, longtime consumer advocate, corporate critic, former presidential candidate. His great niece, Samia Stumo, died on the Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302. Ralph Nader is the author of many books, including Collision Course, The Truth About Airline Safety. He just wrote an open letter to Boeing titled, Passengers First, Ground the 737 MAX 8 Now. Ralph Nader, let's begin with you first. Our condolences to you, to your family, to your sister Laura Nader, a beloved professor of anthropology at University of California, Berkeley, uh, whose granddaughter Samuel is. Uh, we are so sorry to hear about the death of your grandniece. When did you last see her? We had dinner together on Friday. She had leadership, compassion, and intellectual rigor written all over her. It's the kind of leadership we expect from the young generation going into the, the next decades. And her commitment was to global health and prevention and not just diagnosis and treatment. And she was very rigorous about what works and what doesn't in underdeveloped countries regarding infection, infectious diseases and other ailments and environmental safety. So she really had it all. Uh, I think she learned a lot at the University of Copenhagen where she got her Masters of Health. And this is a terrible, terrible tragedy. And not just for her, all the people on the plane, there were many uh, aid workers, people working in food, drinking water, environment, uh, helping people in need. And it's, uh, it's a tragedy for all those people in the future who, who will not be saved by her good work. She went to University of Massachusetts Amherst and was homeschooled before that, now working for an organization, ThinkWell, where she was working on health issues in Africa. That, that's right. It was her first trip 
uh, under her new job to Africa, very enthusiastic. And uh, she got to Addis Ababa and boarded this killer plane, the MAX, 737 MAX 8. That is the harbinger for the future, people. They are going to use more and more artificial intelligence. In this case, this is a plane whose misguided software overpowered its own pilots. And that's why people like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk warned a few years ago in an open letter to the world that if we don't control artificial intelligence, it's going to destroy it. And, and Ralph, you, uh, you've uh, uh, sent a letter to uh, the folks at Boeing. Could you talk about the, your, not only the reaction that you had when you heard of what had happened to your, to your great niece and all the others on the plane, but your sense of what Boeing is doing or not doing right now? Boeing is used to getting its way with the Patsy FAA. And this time, however, it's in really hot water. If it continues to dig its heels in, uh, it's going to uh, expose itself and its executives to potential criminal prosecution because they are now on notice with two crashes in Indonesia and Ethiopia. There's probably a lot more to come out in terms of the technical dissent in the, what was called heated discussions about the plane software between the FAA, the pilots, uh, union, uh, Boeing, and you can't suppress technical dissent forever. And Senators Markey and Blumenthal are calling uh, for the release of all the relevant information. And while that happens, the planes must be grounded. You see, they're on notice now. This is the future uh, of passenger business for Boeing. They've got orders for over 3,000 planes from all over the world. They've produced and delivered about 350. Southwest is the leading owner and operator of these planes. It's digging its heels in, and uh, so is uh, uh, American Airlines, I believe, um, and Air Canada. And uh, Boeing is not going to get away with this because this is not some old DC-9 about to be phased out. This is their future strategic plan, and they better own up. They, 2013, they grounded the 787 because of battery fires, and they had about 50 or 60 of those planes. So there's plenty of precedent. The most important thing that people can do is do not fly this plane, the 737 MAX 8 and 9. Ask the airline uh, when you book a flight uh, whether it, it's that plane, the airline should not dare charge you for reservation uh, changes. And I'm calling for a boycott of that plane. If several hundred thousand air passengers boycott that plane and there are more and more empty seats, that'll do more to bring Boeing around than the Patsy FAA and a rather serene Congress. And why is Congress so willing to let airlines do what they want? a rather serene Congress, which, by the way, gets all kinds of freebies from the airlines that ordinary people don't get. We've sent a survey last year twice to every member of Congress asking them to disclose all these freebies. We didn't get one answer. And that helps account for, over the years, the total reluctance of members of Congress even to do such things as deal with seat size, restroom space, and other conveniences, never mind just the safety of the aircraft. This is called corruption. A day or so after Nader's call, when virtually every country in the world grounded their Boeings, the United States did too. Let me remind you that in the 1990s, Ralph Nader campaigned for sealing off the flight cabin from the rest of the plane to prevent hijackings. The corporations said this was too expensive. In 2001, Al-Qaeda hijackers took advantage of this vulnerability on September 11th. 
March 15th is the anniversary of the start of the Syrian uprising. It is gratifying to see two tweets of support from two young members of Congress, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. This is from a demonstration in Algeria. Note the Syrian and Algerian flag. I'd like to introduce a member of, uh, of United Against Racism, Fascism, NYC, Yanis Dalatolas. He's a socialist, supporter of international socialist tendency. He's a photographer, and he's done anti-fascist organizing in, Greek and New in Greece and New York. Yanis. It's great to see you here today. This is a wonderful turnout for uh, what we hope will be uh, a tradition uh, of anti-fascist organizing and in solidarity with the anti-fascist movement. The fascists are organizing internationally. They have links between them. They help each other. Steve Bannon has an office in Brussels. So we, we really have to take, oh yes, we have to take international solidarity very seriously. After yesterday's horrific attacks in the two mosques in New Zealand, can anyone say that we were surprised? We were horrified, profoundly saddened and shocked, but not surprised. In this country, especially since Trump election, Trump's election and around the world, from Europe to Brazil to India, racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism and xenophobia are all on the rise. Racism has become acceptable in the mainstream media. It is harbored by democratically elected governments and are presumably liberal institutions. This is the context in which 22 of us met last October in a room at a university to address this racism that has emboldened the fascists and the far right. We felt there was an urgent need to create United Against Racism and Fascism. In our efforts, we draw inspiration from various directions, including the successful experiences of the Greek, uh, European, and European anti-fascist movements in containing the fascist threats. Here today, I would like to briefly talk about that. In the past, I worked closely with KERFA, Movement United Against Racism and the Fascist Threat one of the most active organizations in the, on the Greek left, which was created when the economic crisis hit the country and racist attacks and attacks on left-wing militants started rising. It has been 10 years already. The left was gaining in popularity and the neo-Nazi Golden Dawn, once a marginal group, was making inroads and finally entered parliament in 2012. Golden Dawn cadre would leave the local offices, 
organized into street gangs armed with knives and clubs in search of anarchists, leftists, and immigrants. These assault squads and this type of activities that were based in the Nazi party's stormtroops would land Golden Dawn in court for using its offices to organize uh, these attacks. Under Greek law, this kind of activity falls under the definition of running a criminal organization. <laughs> On January 17, 2013, Shazad Lukman and 27-year-old Pakistani worker, while biking to his uh, early morning shift at a local market, was stabbed and killed by two Greek men. They were both quickly arrested, and while searching their apartments, they found uh, literature of a Golden Dawn party and knives, just like the one that was used to murder, to murder the young immigrant. They were eventually found guilty, but initially, the police claimed that this was purely coincidental. Brutal attacks against immigrants and refugees continue to take place, organized by Golden Dawn, the media continued to give Golden Dawn coverage and treated them as if they were rock stars by inviting them to daily shows for, to interview them. Kerfa actively sought an alliance with the Pakistani community of Greece as well as the Afghani and Egyptian and other immigrant communities. Together, they campaigned and staged press releases releasing the graphic photos of the victims of these attacks on social media. This united front forced both the authorities and the media to respond, but it was not automatic. It took another murder that Do Golden Dawn organized. This time, the victim was the Greek anti-fascist hip-hop artist Pavlos Fisas, who was assassinated by an assault team organized by the fascist party's leadership. The anti-fascist movement erupted. There was a huge demonstration to the Golden Dawn headquarters. This anti-fascist ex uh, anti explosion was followed by an anti-fascist strike by the public sector workers' union. The authorities feared an uprising at that point, similar to the one that followed the assassination of Alexis Grigoropoulos, a teenage protester who was shot point black by a Greek policeman in 2008. The anti-fascist movement's lawyers, also known as Jail Golden Dawn Initiative, presented a mountain of evidence sorry, tying, Golden up, tying Golden Dawn up in a very long trial, the largest and longest trial against fascism since the Nuremberg trials. There is little trust towards the courts, or even the current self-described leftist government in Greece. The anti-fascist movement is keeping the pressure up, and alongside with immigrant communities, has taken repeatedly to the streets to meet Golden Dawn head-on. She's representing an incredible group called Outlive Them. Which she'll tell you a bit more about them. Her name is Sirona. She's a lifelong New Yorker, a CUNY alum, and an, out, and an organizer with Outlive Them NYC, which is a coalition of anti-fascist Jews and anti-racist accomplices of all backgrounds. Give it up for Sharona. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Um, I'm out here representing Outlive Them, which is part of an international network of anti-fascist Jews on uh, pretty much every continent except Antarctica. Um, Outlive Them NYC came together last October after the Pittsburgh pogrom. We were, uh, many of us, at the vigil in Union Square hearing lots of words about thoughts and prayers and voting. And we were so angry and full of rage and decided to get together and talk about what we could do to eliminate the far right, the ability of the far right to organize in New York City. Um, so we are not just Jews, we're people of all stripes and all backgrounds. Um, and I have some notes, hold on. Fascism is a threat to our survival. Literally a threat to the survival of everyone standing here. 
Whether it's racist, sexist, killer cops on the streets of New York City, concentration camps at the border, or radicalized far-right vigilante violence against our communities and friends and allies, we have literally no choice but to win. Also, I just want to echo what my comrade from the Freedom Socialist Party said before, that um, this fascist violence, this resurgence of American fascism and fascism globally, the export of American fascism and white supremacy to other nations in the world, um, is not an aberration of a normally peaceful society. This is hegemonic white Christian capitalism working exactly as intended, trying to hold on to the last dregs of power as the working class is uniting and trying to take itself back, trying to take back its power. Um, and something, I can just speak from experience that in October, um, you know, uh, I met many of the people and outlived them when I traveled last August to Charlottesville to defend the synagogue um, from the Unite the Right the second time. The first time there were Nazis marching up and down the street outside the synagogue with guns in formation um, and the synagogue was unlocked and the people inside didn't know what was going on and they escaped through a back door narrowly avoiding a horrible disaster tragedy, not a disaster, a tragedy. Um, so a group of us organized to go back the second time. That's where I met these amazing comrades and we came together and now we're here today. And uh, we were feeling really empowered about everything that we could possibly do, working with other anti-fascists in the city. And then the pogrom in Pittsburgh happened. And I can speak from experience that I was left feeling incredibly stunned, paralyzed, cold, distraught, powerless, so upset. It was uh, unlike I, unlike anything I, as a cis white woman, have ever felt before, um, and it took took some time to realize that that is exactly what they want. They want us to feel powerless. They want us to feel isolated, further alienated from each other. They want us to feel just afraid to go to shul, afraid to go to our temples. Um, kind of became cold, became paralyzed, and uh, if we let them succeed in that, that's a double crime. I'd like to introduce Hassam Gamea, the Outreach Director of the Islamic Leadership Council of New York, an umbrella organization that represents over 90 mosques and organizations. He has been involved in grassroots organizing and activism within the Muslim community since 2011. Hassam Gamea. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. Um, so, we all know what happened on Friday. On uh, Friday in New Zealand, Thursday night in New York. And, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Of course. And what we saw after the attack happened was many people coming out in support of the Muslim community, supposedly. But many of those people who came out in vocal support of the Muslim community have been the ones who have been contributing to the Islamophobic narratives that have resulted in that violence. Right. When you have people, when you have politicians and children of politicians who will attack a Muslim woman in Congress for talking right. about lobbyist groups yes. and organizations yes. that have dumped millions of dollars yes. into the Islamophobic industry yes. and call her anti-Semitic yes. for it, yes. but have not said a single word, have not condemned a single time the 26,000 bombs yes. that were dropped on Muslim countries in 2016 yes. alone are tired. I'm not coming here to be your peaceful Muslim. I'm not coming here to tell you Islam is about peace. Islam is also about justice. Yes. I'm here demanding justice for my community. I'm here demanding accountability for CNN, Fox yes. News, the New York Times, yes. Time Magazine, the Washington Post, yes. all of these media outlets which claim that they support and they're against uh, uh, the, the fascism or the right wing racism of Donald Trump who have contributed for decades to the suffering of my people, to the suffering of my community. I want accountability for these people. They are not allowed to claim solidarity with us if they refuse to condemn their, their own actions and their own complicity and my people's suffering.
These are photos from other anti-fascist demonstrations on the 16th, mostly from Greece. Notice the three-starred flag of Syrian democratic forces in this photo. I'm not positive about this one, but I believe it took place in London. All these signs say, stand up to racism. And before we leave the fascism segment, I want to talk about an exclusive new article in our India archive about Modi and what he has done to India. It is chilling. Anti-nuclear activist Frida Berrigan will speak for promoting enduring peace on Tuesday, March 26th. Her topic, nuclear weapons have destroyed my life and are destroying yours too. Her mother and several other protesters are in jail in Georgia awaiting trial for entering the Kings Bay sub-base. This is a bit of what she told the audience last year at the Gandhi Peace Award about the nuclear armed submarines that are housed in Kings Bay. Right. Each Trident submarine at Kings Bay is capable of carrying the explosive power of 1,825 Hiroshima's. 1,825 Hiroshima's. In theory, each submarine could kill 200 to 300 million people. Closing on a bit of good news, startling actually, a sign of the times. The APAC lobby for Israeli apartheid is accustomed to getting scores of politicians from both parties at its annual convention. But this week, eight presidential candidates are staying away. That's very significant. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.